Well, good evening, Brennan, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi Lockdown Lecture Series, Zoom meeting number 56. Uh, as we said last week at our anniversary lecture, Bern, we will continue hosting this weekly lecture series until we get some news from the Grand Lodge of Scotland when we may be able to resume our meetings face to face. Uh, we just don't quite yet know when that will be, uh, but hopefully there is some light at the end of the tunnel for us all, Bern. Uh, as usual, can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines for Zoom meetings? Please uh, keep your video working and a recognisable name within uh, the screen so I know who you are, Brian. Thank you so much. Brian, uh, some of you will be aware that I'm a member of the Internet Lodge and uh, a few weeks after we started the lockdown lecture series, the Internet Lodge of the United Grand Lodge of England followed suit and have been having uh, a weekly lecture series on a Sunday evening, uh, along with uh, a Sunday morning get together for social purposes and a Wednesday evening get together for social purposes. But on one of their uh, lecture series is a witness brother, Terry Callow, a very worshipful brother, Terry Callow, uh, from the Philippines, who's a member of the Internet Lodge, give a presentation on the history of Freemasonry in the Philippines. Now, at first I thought, well, five o'clock on a Sunday, he's prepared to do that. Am I persuasive enough to see if he'd be prepared to stay up another couple of extra hours and uh, stay up for the early hours of the morning in the Philippines to come and present to uh, the original and the best lockdown lecture series that we've seen across craft Freemasonry. Uh, across the globe and I'm delighted that Terry said yes to me Brian and uh, without any further ado it gives me the greatest of pleasure to introduce brother Terry Callow. Thank you brother Gordon and good evening brethren or good morning from wherever you are across the world. I'm so happy to be with you today and I'm happy that uh, Gordon invited me to start off the second year of your uh, series in this uh, Lodge of Research, where Brother Gordon and I are both, as he has highlighted, members of Internet Lodge number 9659 in the English Constitution. And a big shout out to all the brothers who are with us today. You're going to see a, a repeat with some refinements of what I presented. For the rest of you, I'm happy that it was Brother Gordon who invited me because of that lecture, because otherwise, I would suspect, given that it's been a year already, that you might be scraping the bottom of the barrel to find somebody across the world, to, uh, given that there are, this is the second year running of your series. But having said that, thank you very much for accommodating me. And I hope the story I share tonight uh, will be of interesting to uh, some of you, because what I have to talk about when it comes to Freemasonry here in my country is a very unique narrative of how the craft developed, not just within uh, regular Freemasonry, but also uh, from outside. First, let me talk about our Grand Lodge. Uh, it was founded in December 19, 1920, 12. Uh, nine years ago, eight years ago, we uh, celebrated our centennial. Uh, from the three lodges from the Grand Lodge of California that founded it. So we trace our ancestry for, to, from the uh, Grand Lodge of California to the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts and uh, Pennsylvania and all the rest that founded the Grand Lodge of California and from the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts to the United Grand Lodge of England. I highlight that because normally uh, in regular Freemasonry, you can trace as the descent from the UGLE or the or Grand Lodge of uh, Scotland or Ireland directly from those three uh, Grand Lodges. But because we came around from the United States, I am not surprised that many brothers in the United Kingdom know very little about our Grand Lodge, despite the fact that as of last year, we breached the 20,000 mark when it comes to regular brethren. And we're growing at the clip of three to five percent every year. Uh, that's the that's the sheer number of uh, the volume of petitioners uh, coming in highlights 
uh, this past two decades, since, uh, particularly since our centennial, the popularity of the craft here in the archipelago. When I was uh, initiated in 2003, there were only about 214, 220 lodges. Now we're double that, 412. And we probably will have over 20. This is, uh, there are 16 now under dispensation, but there are several new ones. So we probably will have 20 new lodges when we convene next month, this April, for our next annual communication. That's Philippine Freemasonry here uh, in the Philippines today uh, in Southeast Asia. We are the most senior Grand Lodge uh, in Asia. For the first to uh, be recognized first by the Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia and subsequently by the United Grand Lodge of England, I understand in 1916, if I'm, uh, if I'm, if I'm correct. But that's really, uh, that's what, in my view, what really makes us interesting. What makes us unique in the world, and I think what has a special appeal for the craft in my country is that in the Philippines, we're very proud of our roots, the craft's roots in our history. Brethren who become, uh, petitioners who become brethren in my country, uh, they get used to hearing this phrase, Freemasonry is being Filipino. And the craft is a, in our country, is the foundation of our nation. For all of you in the English, Scottish, and Irish constitutions, that should give you pause. You should ask, really, how's that possible? How's that possible? I want to highlight that the picture you're seeing here is our national hero, Jose Rizal. Uh, we call him the great Malayan because it was from him, his writings, that we first began uh, to think about becoming a country from our Spanish colonial roots. But going back to my thesis, you should ask and you should question, how can this be the case if we are regular Freemasons? Who are regular Freemasons? As you know, uh, in the English constitution, they have these eight basic principles. If you do not follow these eight basic principles, you cannot be recognized by the UGLE. Number seven, highlighted in red there, is the fact that you cannot discuss religion or politics within the lodge. Now that gets you to think. If that's the case, how is the craft so intertwined with the history of our nation? Well, I have to highlight that while the first Freemasons in our country were regular Freemasons. The country developed initially through a tradition, through the, the European continental tradition of Freemasonry known as continental Freemasonry. For those of you who are uh, English and uh, the uh, 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 well, uh, British in particular, I don't know if you know this, but uh, my country has, if it ever decided to, has a pretty good case for uh, joining the Commonwealth. Because if you can get former Portuguese colonies uh, in, in Africa to join you, you should uh, you have no problem getting us to join because hypothetically, we were for two years a former British colony. In 1762, the uh, East India Company financed an expedition to uh, come over here and seize our capital of Manila. Now that's as far as the, they got uh, Manila, but uh, for those two years uh, during that war, the uh, first Freemasons, the first Masonic lodges uh, to arrive in this country were from that expedition, uh, military field lodges, which accompanied that expedition. So the, this is a book on that uh, time. However, uh, 
um, when the uh, when e- when the when England made peace with Spain, and the Philippines was returned to uh, Spain uh, in uh, 1764, those traveling field lodges left, and it was this person uh, here, this brother here by the name of Jose Malcampo, who brought uh, Freemasonry to the Philippines. Not a regular lodge, but a continental lodge. Actually, he brought it uh, uh, as he served twice in my country. First as a young lieutenant uh, with his fellow brother, Castro Segundo Maria Mendez Nunez. And eventually he came back as governor general of the country. So Jose Malcampo helped in organizing the first Continental Masonic Lodge year, not regular, but Continental Masonic Lodge year, which was the Primera Luz Filipina in uh, Cavita province, immediately south of Manila in 1856, under the Grand Oriente, Luis Español. Now, as you know, for those of you who are familiar with Continental Freemasonry, they can discuss politics in the Lodge. As a matter of fact, they are very reform-minded in the fact that they focus on applying our philosophy towards pushing or advocating for liberal reforms. Malcampo himself was not a reformist, but he helped bring the the craft here, even if it's in its continental version. Uh, In this regard, I want to also highlight, he also was responsible for naming the first municipality in my country, uh, the first municipality named after a Freemason in my country. And that is the municipality of Mendez Nunez, whose seal that you see here. You see his brother Mason, Mendez Nunez died during their stint here. So when he came over as governor general, he uh, made sure that in the province where Lieutenant Nunez died, that a municipality would be named after him. And that municipality exists until this day. The first Filipino who actually joined, uh, it was very limited to those of Spanish blood, is the, pers- is the brother you see here in the center of the, bot- of this bo- uh, of the bottom row. His name is Jacopo Zobel. Previous to him, only the Spanish could join the continental lodges that were being formed. And he was uh, his admission to Primera, Primera Luz Filipina marked the first time that somebody here, Jacobo Zobel was born in the country, uh, got to be uh, in, initiated, passed and raised as a Freemason. Here's the thing with those lodges. Those lodges were almost exclusively filled with Spanish brethren. The reason why Jacobo Zobel joined is because he was a very prominent member of the local aristocracy. And for most of those who were in the islands, they they could not have access to the craft as we knew it then, uh, the continental lodges who were here. But eventually, another way was opened to them. And that way was opened not by Jose Malcampo, but a successor to his governor generalship. He's also another brother in the continental tradition. His name was Emilio Terrero. You see, during the 1800s, if you go into the history of Spain, there was also because of continental partly because of continental Freemasons, a gradual shift towards pushing liberal reforms. Part of these liberal reforms included bringing those here in the islands and getting them educated in Spain. One of those educated is the father of Philippine Freemasonry. He's the, per, he's the brother you see here, the one in the big picture and the, the stamp. His name is Marcelo del Pilar. 
And he be, he, we call him the father of Philippine Freemasonry because he, along with Jose Rizal, and our earliest nationalist heroes, got the opportunity to go to Spain and get an education and while partying there, socializing, ended up also joining Masonic Continental Lodges. In these lodges, as you know, which, is, which are different from uh, regular Masonic lodges that we know today, they discussed the liberal reforms that were going through Spain, and they got to wonder why are those reforms not being applicable to the Philippine colony? Needless to state, when you have a spark, that leads to these young colonial locals ending up joining together and forming their own lodge to discuss how do we bring these liberal reforms halfway around, you know, halfway around the world to our country. And that led to the first Marcelo del Pilar Jose Rizal and our other na earlier na earliest nationalist heroes led to the founding of what we call the Solidaridad Lodge. In its first incarnation, it was under the Gran Oriente Español. Uh, but subsequently, uh, it kind of died out because that's the nature of uh, lodges then. Uh, because you have your you're looking at primarily students here. They, they came and go. It died out, but in 1890, it was revived. And during this period, the middle from 1885 to 1892, okay, that marked the year where those, those I'm sorry, that marked the years where these, these colonials who were in Spain, educate to manage to get an education in the continent, banded together and said, we should have reforms in the Philippines. And they used the principles of continental Freemasonry to push these reforms. What you see here is the equilateral triangle that is very prominent in that Masonic tradition. Uh, and that's how they constructed the what they call the propaganda movement. The Solidaridad Lodge would be responsible for strategy and education. In terms of strategy, it had a public face. Almost all Masons continental Freemasons, uh, that was the Asociación Hispano-Filipino who would promote the propaganda campaign together with a fortnightly newspaper known as La Solidaridad. La Solari Solidaridad. Uh, and the Lodge internally with all of its members pushing for reforms and their mouthpiece, La Solidaridad, they would use these two venues to educate them on the liberal ideals that uh, they wanted to bring to their country, which they did. Eventually, Marcelo del Pilar convinced another Filipino, his name is Jose Serrano Lactao, to form Nilad Lodge under the Gran Oriente Español in 1892. And that Nilad Lodge became the first Filipino Lodge. And when you have continental Freemasons now in the Philippines, that can only lead to one thing, a growing movement for reform. What you don't want if you're a colonial government is to, uh, you know, is to have too much of that or they're gonna think of something else. And Spain did it all wrong. Uh, they felt that the only way to crush this movement, you know, with growing lodges here, was to uh, crush it with an iron hand. Because while they were susceptible to reforms in Spain, they wanted to keep the very small number of Spanish here, wanted to keep life as it was. Uh, traditionally, uh, where everything was run by the uh, local colonial government and the church. Well, when you have that kind of persecution, you're going to have people going, the, you know, 
you're, you're actually going to incentivize people to join. And this picture here, outside of the soldiers, whom I don't know if uh, they're masons, but everybody here, with the exception of uh, our second uh, president in 1946, is here at the very end. Everyone here is a Freemason. Mabini, Del Pilar, uh, uh, Andres Bonifacio, our first president, Emilio Aguinaldo, Jose Rizal, Manuel Quezon, all of them are Freemasons. That's what you get when you try to clamp down on something that people, in this case, brethren, wanted to have. They felt that it was time for change. And they had that. With the martyrdom of our national hero, you ended up with the Philippine Revolution. The quote here is from our first president, who is also a Freemason. Okay, uh, The successful revolution of 1896 was Masonically inspired, Masonically led, and Masonically executed. All three of which is true. All of his leaders, well, not all, nearly all of his leaders were Freemasons. Uh, the revolution started uh, not, not just from the largest, but with, a, with societies that were organized the way Masons uh, were, the, the way Masons organized themselves in private societies. Uh, and that became known locally as uh, the Katipunan or the Organization of Brothers. And that is why today, uh, this is our Philippine flag. You will see that the triangle in that flag, that was deliberately put there by Brother Aguinaldo and other Masons to honor our legacy of craft of uh, continental Freemasonry. So we were there. We were going to be the first, not the first actually, uh, the second independent country in Southeast Asia after Thailand, which uh, never had a colonial master. But something intervened. And uh, what intervened was the Spanish-American War. The uh, George Dewey with his uh, Asiatic squadron, the U.S. Asiatic squadron, came over to Manila, sank the, uh, just about the entire Spanish fleet here. And, uh, you know, that led to the American occupation. There's a question I can see from the chat. Was it a peaceful revolution? No. Uh, I want to highlight that, that in terms of uh, actual, uh, uh, it was actually a very bloody revolution. But remember, the, we we're looking at the scale here of Spain never had more than 30,000 troops uh, in my country. However, uh, prior to the, the Americans coming in, uh, it was essentially, uh, you know, uh, Filipinos versus uh, the Spanish. And because there were more Filipinos, you're looking at a population of about two to three million. Uh, it was very hard to quell. And they were on the verge of winning, but for the fact that uh, they, had, they, they were lacking arms. So they called for an armistice. And that was the, uh, that was the point when the Spanish-American War came in. Now, without us having a say, uh, Spain realizing that that we were, uh, you know, that we were going to win and th that they would they would eventually lose the colony, uh, when it made peace with the U.S., sold the Philippines to the United States, the Philippines to to the United States, and that led in turn to the Philippine American War, which we lost primarily for two reasons. The Spanish, the Filipino, the Re Philippine Revolution, uh, unlike the Vietnam War, was set peace battles. It was not guerrilla warfare, because that was how uh, Filipinos who got their training in Europe were trained. And when you're facing a country with far more arms, with far more soldiers, like the U.S. Unless you go guerrilla tactics like uh, Vietnam War, that's not going to cut it. We didn't do that. That's the first. 
The second reason why we lost eventually was because eventually there was infighting uh, within the government. And the Americans used that infighting to uh, gradually take over the entire country. Uh, not, even during the Spanish time, there were pockets in our southern islands, which they never controlled. Uh, these were uh, pockets where the uh, were, were Muslims were predominant. The Americans were able to get uh, take control of the entire archipelago. And that led naturally to us becoming an American colony. Our uh, third masters, if you count the British in their two-year uh, stay here, hypothetically in Manila. Okay, so these are our third colonial masters. And being Americans, uh, they are not of the continental Masonic tradition. The soldiers here who were Freemasons were from uh, the regular Masonic tradition. And the first Masonic lodges to come here were from uh, the Grand Lodge of uh, California. It was a traveling lodge. Uh, brought in by the Regiment of Volunteers of North Dakota. Uh, that was the first. Again, we had military traveling lodges here, but because units were brought in and out, those lodges did, were not sustainable. However, with the influx of colonial officials from the United States, beginning with uh, Gener the father of General uh, Douglas MacArthur, who was also a Mason, and William Howard Taft, who also, uh, some sources say, is also a Mason. These colonial officials recognize that this territory now, in our tradition, and by our tradition, I mean our regular Masonic tradition, uh, the Americans have a knack for this concept of exclusive territorial jurisdiction. They realized that this was open territory, when actually it was not. You see, the, you see the seal in the center, the top row? That's Nilad Lodge. Uh, that was the lodge that was founded in 1891 and uh, chartered in 1892. Okay. Uh, so there were Filipinos who continued to be uh, continental Freemasons practicing their uh, tradition of Freemasonry on the islands. But the majority of uh, American colonial officials coming in didn't care. The influx of not just Americans, but also Europeans to this uh, new uh, colonial master, new economy, uh, new set of rules uh, brought with it tensions. And an example of that tension is this door here locally of a bar, of a club in Manila at that time. You're not going to be able to read it, but uh, that sign there in the middle of the door, okay, uh, that sign is reflective of that era, the first 10 years of American rule from 1900 to 1910. That sign, if you can read it, is uh, basically for the club. No dogs or Filipinos allowed. Take note, the dogs... Uh, you know, are, are, are first than uh, Filipinos. So you, you did have, and I'm, I'm just being uh, historically factual here, you did have a strong element of racism in place, which was uh, a major disincentive for those from the United States who were Masons to recognize uh, the Philippines. You have, and, and you have that challenge up to today. It's only recently that I understand the Grand Lodge of Tennessee um, recognized their Prince Hall counterparts. You still have six Grand Lodges not recognizing the regular Masonic tradition of six Grand Lodges in the US. If, if, if that's a problem for six US states, you can imagine how much that was a problem in, 19, in, the, in the first decade of last century. Okay, so because of this tension and because of the belief of regular Freemasons who were part of the, uh, who, who, who had come in uh, in this uh, 
new colony, new American colony, that they didn't want to affiliate with them, the Grand Lodge of California started to issue regular, that's their seal here, started to issue regular uh, charters to lodges here, starting in 1901 with Manila 342. Manila 342 would eventually become Manila Mount Lebanon number one. That's their seal at the bottom row that I'm pointing to here. In addition, they had Cavite 350. That would become Cavite number two. And Corridor 386, okay, which would become Corridor number three on our rolls. That's the American side. There were other lodges uh, that came in precisely because it was open territory. Uh, and I'm happy to state that your constitution, the Scottish uh, constitution, brought two lodges here. Uh, this is, of course, your seal. In 1907, okay, Lodge Perla del Oriente was chartered under your constitution. It celebrated 14 years ago. It's centennial. It's a very vibrant lodge here. Uh, and it, uh, secondly, Cebu Lodge. Uh, there was also a Cebu Lodge uh, that was chartered in 1912 but died in the 1920s. Now, the Scottish Lodge was for Englishmen and other European brethren who were very suspicious of the Americans. So, in effect, you had a triangle of Masons in the young American colony. And where you have uh, everybody saying that we are the legitimate branch of Freemasonry here, you effectively are going to have a, a significant conflict, particularly when the locals, the Filipinos that we, that they, they now call themselves Filipinos, when the local lodges are filled with members who are prominent in the local community. Needless to state, that led to uh, significant altercation socially uh, with someone saying I'm of Mason and another saying I'm a Mason then you know you'd have altercations during uh, during parties and of course you had in addition uh, social events and uh, and activities and functions where Filipinos were not allowed so this came to a head in 1912. Uh, the three lodges chartered by the Grand Lodge of California recognizing that it would be best if they were to one up the Filipinos uh, to seek recognition abroad and make and, and claim this uh, territory for them, not just to counter you know the strong local presence of continental Freemasons here, but primarily because they also didn't like uh, the fact that uh, your constitution, uh, the Scottish constitution, already had a foot in the Philippines, literally speaking, with Lodge Perla del Oriente and the Cebu Lodge. So on December 19, 1912, these three lodges, Manila, 342, Cavite, 350, Corredor, 386, they came and formed the Grand Lodge, what was then called the Grand Lodge of the Philippine Islands, needless to state. And perhaps for the uh, benefit of uh, all Freemasons, Perla del Oriente refused to join. I guess you can see now why. And that is the reason why, although we have, have eventually unified all uh, lodges here in the country under the Grand Lodge of the Philippines, the successor to the Grand Lodge of the Philippine Islands, the uh, Lodge Perla del Oriente is uh, with, with, I understand, two Prince Hall Lodges, the only uh, other regular lodges allowed to work our craft in the country. And uh, if you visit Manila, I would encourage you to visit them. They're a vi very vibrant lodge. They're at, uh, they're, they're at their, their, uh, hall, their meeting hall is in the headquarters of our local Scottish Rite uh, here in Manila. So now you have one Grand Lodge. 
here's the challenge. The Filipinos, okay, were able, realizing that that's where the Americans were heading in 1908. Uh, oh, uh, oh, oh I'm sorry, 1906. 1906 uh, decided that they would also try to go on that path by forming the, a regional Grand Lodge called the Grand Lodge Rional de Filipinas under the Grand Oriente Español. Primarily to get continental Freemasons to support their position that they are the true branch in the country. So you basically had a war between continental Freemasonry and regular Freemasonry here in the country. And you had a war where you had essentially two different audiences with the regular Freemasons, primarily through um, the three lodges that became the Grand Lodge of the Philippine Islands, working the expats who, who came here uh, to uh, uh, in the new young colony of the United States. And the, the uh, the Grand Loia Rional de Filipinas, composed of Filipinos, promoting itself to uh, Filipinos. Okay? And that led to, again, significant uh, problems socially because, frankly, the most prominent members of the local elite were members of these lodges, and the most prominent members of American colonial officialdom were members of the new Grand Lodge. But here's the thing. So you have that situation and you know that the culture of racism for some is there. Something you, you would normally think that, you know, this would continue on. And, uh, but there were, cracks in this wall between the two brethren. And one significant crack there is uh, the person you see here that I'm pointing to. He's my great grandfather. Uh, I'm Chodoro Kal the fourth. He's Chodoro M. Kalao. There's uh, a street in our central park named after him for, for other things. But Chodoro M. Kalao uh, was a news, was a, my, my great grandfather was a um, reform-minded newspaper editor who went after one of the more abusive colonial officials known as Dean Worcester and Secretary Worcester, Secretary of the Interior Worcester, whom he, who was accused of stealing, among other things, Igorot skulls for, so that he, this can be displayed in the United States, ended up suing my great-grandfather. And uh, that's why my great grandfather ended up in U.S. jurisprudence. Suit all went all the way up to the uh, United States Supreme Court. He got convicted, and uh, he would have ended up in prison. Okay, he would have ended up in prison, and I would uh, be the descendant of a convicted felon because of uh, because of that libel conviction. But for the fact that uh, he was pardoned by Governor General Harrison soon after the conviction became final. So he never served a day in prison. Here's the thing. Governor General Harrison, okay, there's actually a, ma a major avenue in my country named after him today because Filipinos came to really love him was a very active Freemason. And his pardoning, not just of my great-grandfather, but of everyone else in uh, that libel case, cost him his political career. After the governor generalship, uh, he, I understand he did not serve in another political office. Uh, and the Filipinos recognized that sacrifice. The Filipinos recognized that in doing that, he wasn't doing something that was politically convenient, but was correct. But was correct. And that led to dialogue, among other incidents. And that growing dialogue now between Harrison and the other American Freemasons 
led to more Filipinos saying, maybe we can try to see if we can resolve this continuing conflict between us. While the Filipinos were getting closer to the Americans, their patron in uh, Spain, Grandmaster Miguel Moraita, died on January 24, 1917. And that was significant because with that death, uh, that allowed the Filipinos now to uh, negotiate with the Americans and on uh, February 13, a few weeks after 1917, formally petitioned to join. So you had these 28 uh, Filipino lodges, okay, joining from uh, NILAD number 12 uh, on February of 1917. A special meet uh, session was called. You had all of these Filipinos lodges, all of the all of the continental Masonic lodges in the islands. Then come in, surrender their charters from the Gran Oriente Español, and petition formally to join, and they were granted charters from Nilad number twelve to Bulusan number thirty eight. So you would think normally, hey, the Americans won, right? I mean, uh, the Filipinos ended up surrendering, but uh, the, uh, and the Americans got to keep their Grand Lodge of the Philippine Islands in accordance with the doctrine of exclusive territorial jurisdiction uh, over the country. That's what appears on the surface. I want to highlight, brethren, that with the surrender and acceptance of all of these continental Freemasons on the fold, okay, what the Americans knew when they were doing that is that they were effectively converting the Grand Lodge of the Philippine Islands from a Grand Lodge dominated by American regular Freemasons to a Grand Lodge where the Filipinos were in the majority. That's why if you uh, look back, remember Manila, Mount Lebanon, number uh, 342, that became Manila, uh, number one, and subsequently Manila, Mount Lebanon with the merger of a lodge. Uh, there were only 11 American lodges at that time. And against that 11, they had to accommodate uh, new lodges from Nilad Lodge number 12, to Bulusa number 38. So those 27 new lodges in that same session uh, with their acceptance effectively converted that Grand Lodge to a truly local uh, Masonic Lodge. So for the Americans, they felt, why'd they do that? Why did they do that? given the culture of racism rampant in the, in the young colony then. There are many reasons, uh, but really, I think what pushed the Americans to doing this is uh, primarily two things. One, their growing respect for the local Filipinos who they got to over the uh, two decades leading to 1917, got to be in dialogue with. And more importantly, uh, arising from that growing respect, their recognition that if they wanted to uh, build a Grand Lodge that would be sustainable and would outlast them, they had no choice but to bring in Filipinos. So they recognized that. And with the merger or uh, 1917, you had Filipino lodges come in and they expected to, uh, of course, the Americans expected the Filipino grandmaster to, to take over, to be elected. Uh, but that's not what happened. Uh, you see, when the lodges voted, 
the masters and wardens of the respective lodges voted, after the 11 lodges on the part of the Americans who voted for the incumbent grandmaster, William Taylor, you had every single Filipino lodge voting for him as hell. Now, this came as a shock for most worshipful Taylor. So he goes to his deputy, uh, the deputy grandmaster, uh, John Wallace, and he says, Hey, I was expecting to retire. I thought this, uh, I thought Quezon, Quezon is uh, th th this person here. He would become uh, our, my country's second president uh, when the Commonwealth of the Philippines was inaugurated in 1935. He thought Quezon would, would end up succeeding him. Well, Filipinos kept him on. And that, I think they're, their openness to highlighting that, you know, we are going to preserve the traditions you have led to true understanding, to true brotherhood, which you see in our uh, Grand Lodge, uh, our, our Grand Lodge Temple today, uh, Plaridel uh, Masonic Temple. Uh, Plaridel is the pseudonym for Marcelo del Pilar. So that's his Masonic uh, pseudonym. If you go to our, my Grand Lodge temple today, where I usually have this, sometimes deliver this speech, and you go to our main social hall, and you look at uh, all of the portraits of our grandmasters, you will see, not, and please note, there's nothing, there's no agreement in writing here. Uh, it was, you know, this is just a tradition. You will see from all of those portraits, an unbroken line of American, Filipino, American, Filipino, grandmasters. Unbroken line. There, there was a time when the Grand Lodge went dark in World War II, but other than that, from 1917 with William Taylor followed by uh, the one who beca would become our second president, Manuel Quezon, you see him here. Then John Wallace, then Rafael Palma going forward. Right until my grandfather, Teodoro Calo Jr., became grandmaster in 1974. From 1917 to 1974, okay, uh, you had an unbroken string of American and Filipino grandmasters. Why did it die out? Because by 1974, we simply could not find a brother from a brother American here who uh, was worthy and well-qualified. We had simply run out of, uh, of uh, worthy and well-qualified brethren from the American side, okay? There were, of course, exceptions to the fusion primarily, and thankfully, uh, Lodge Perla del Oriente continues to this day. There were attempts to revive the regional Grand Lodge in the 1920s. All of these died out. There are, were, of course, occasional schisms. These died out. Today, uh, we're celebrating our 108th year as a Grand Lodge. Uh, and we are celebrating that with uh, this tradition of continental Freemasonry merged uh, in our history. Needless to state, that gave us a lot of, uh, um, that gave us, a, you know, in the region, uh, that gave us an opportunity to, to, to really shine because we were the first and only uh, Grand Lodge in the region. Of course, you, you know, uh, your constitutions have, have, uh, have districts here, but being based in the region that facilitated us uh, branching out to the rest of uh, uh, the uh, Asia Pacific region. Our lodges that were originally formed in mainland China uh, in 1950, 1949, requested permission to become the Grand Lodge of China. Our lodges that were created in Japan after the occupation in 1957 uh, ended up becoming the Grand Lodge of Japan. So we are the uh, mother Grand Lodge to both of these regular uh, jurisdictions. Uh, we also have to this date uh, lodges still in South Korea, 
uh, some in Japan, uh, the Marianas Islands, and we still have a, uh, a lodge chartered in Vietnam, uh, Saigon Lodge 188, which temporarily in uh, 1975 moved here uh, and is still meeting here uh, until potentially the day when uh, it, can, it can come back. So that's the, uh, that's the stature of, uh, of the Grand Lodge in the region and in the United States. The fact that we could, brethren, could accommodate those they saw, uh, well, at least some of them saw as inferior to them and treat them as true brothers, I think facilitated eventually six decades later, the beginning of, uh, in, in some way, the beginning of state Grand Lodges recognizing uh, Prince Hall uh, Grand Lodges. If you wonder why uh, General MacArthur's picture is here, uh, I just want to highlight he may be an American general, but he is a Filipino Freemason. He was uh, made a Mason on site, one of only two. In, 19, in the 1930s by Most Worshipful Hawthorne. And he became a very active Mason. He was attached to Manila Mount Lebanon number one, was able to observe the degrees and he became a very active uh, Freemason since then, keeping uh, always uh, very uh, proud to be a Filipino Freemason. That's why in our constitution today, you have the situation where we claim territory, not just in the Philippines, but to all those other areas because uh, we were fortunate enough to be the, first, the most senior uh, Grand uh, Lodge in this region. Uh, giving birth to China, the Grand Lodge of China, the Grand Lodge of Japan, and mu much before the founding of the Grand Lodge of India in 1961, the Grand Lodge of Israel in 1953, and the Grand Lodge of Kazakhstan, our newest Asian Grand Lodge in 2016. Uh, I want to highlight that in addition to that, because of the popularity of the craft in this country, many Filipinos who go abroad or who emigrate abroad end up uh, wanting to be members of the craft abroad. That's why we have this long tradition of lodges in other grand uh, jurisdictions being composed of Filipino brethren. So... We have uh, Filipino, we have brethren who are Filipinos, but are uh, American Freemasons in uh, the District of Columbia, uh, Australia, New South Wales, Manitoba, and New York. In uh, just recently, two years back, uh, part of my extended uh, work, uh, question on what ritual is work, these four, New York, Manitoba, New South Wales, District of Columbia, they work their own rituals. These are largest chartered in those grand lodge, uh, in, the, in those constitutions. But in 2019, we had the first, uh, this is part of our extended term. I accompanied our grand master, Most Worshipful Suan, to the Grand Lodge of Victoria on an initiative initiated uh, much earlier by another grand master. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, uh, concluded a memorandum of understanding where for the first time, uh, the Grand Lodge of Victoria, Victoria allowed one of its chartered lodges to work Filipino ritual. So how, 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 how could that be if their Grand Lodge inspectors uh, don't know our ritual? Of course, you know, all of us being regular Freemasons, you know that there, there's some uniformity, right? But how can that happen? Well, part of the Armoa is for us to have, uh, is us on our part committing to send what we call grand lecturers uh, to Victoria on a regular basis so that their inspectors can be taught the ritual, and not just inspectors, but the members of Plaridel Lodge number 1893. That is a first for us. And I know of, uh, while the Grand Lodge of Victoria does have other uh, lodges which work foreign rituals. All of these rituals are not exclusive, like yours, like yours uh, constitution. Here, uh, because we come in from a jurisdiction uh, like Pennsylvania and California and uh, the District of Columbia and Massachusetts, where there is only one ritual that must be worked, 
this is the first time where the, the Grand Lodge of Victoria uh, has allowed a lodge in its jurisdiction composed primarily of Filipinos to use uh, that exclusive ritual. And we're looking forward to bringing that to other lodges uh, of Filipinos abroad uh, with time given interest. So going back to my main narrative. So how can, why do we say that uh, Philippine, that Freemasonry therefore is being Filipino? Why, why is that such a, a the popular catchphrase, particularly among brethren in my country? Primarily because of three reasons, which I hope the story I've told you has highlighted. First among this is that it is the product of a unique fusion of genuine brotherly love, where you had Americans purposely accept brethren from outside regular Freemasonry and retaught them, okay, the craft and rituals and uh, rituals appropriate to regular Freemasonry. One of the uh, one of the disadvantages of that is that we no longer use our continental rituals, but what we have passed on, we have gained with the regular Freemasons, Freemason, uh, regular, uh, the rituals of regular Freemasonry, which we practice today. Secondly, I think uh, Freemasonry is, you know, inherently Filipino here because uh, of the fact that it promotes our, not just continental Freemasons, but also regular Freemasons, our, of our commitment to promote religious tolerance. And that was extremely challenging in the then Spanish colony, uh, where at that time, the state and the church were united. I'm not joking. Uh, the, uh, if the governor general was absent, the one who would be acting governor general would be the local Spanish bishop, okay? Uh, that's how merged the, the, the then church, uh, the, then, the, then, the, the then Catholic church and the, um, and the state was. And because many Filipinos grew up in that atmosphere, because many, most of them were Catholic, okay? They naturally were of that frame of mind when they were drafting our first constitution in 1898. Uh, at that time, the um, Catholics brought up, despite the fact that you know, the uh, church abuses at that time were a cause of uh, our, of the problems in the colony, the Catholics, because of that perspective, brought up a clause for the new constitution requiring that the Philippines officially be uh, that the official religion of the country be Roman Catholicism. Needless to state, for those of uh, delegates who were Masons, they knew right then and there that would be a problem. If that clause were put in our constitution and brought to today, we would not have a unified Philippines. We would not have our Muslims, uh, our significant Muslim minority, minority with us because in effect they would officially be second class citizen. It was a fellow brother named Tomas del Rosario who led the opposition and, pro uh, and proposed an alternative which was the freedom of religion clause and that one by one vote. So because of Freemasons and their advocacy of religious tolerance, the Philippines today is a united country. Needless to state, uh, most worshipful Rafael Palma, uh, the second Filipino Grandmaster after Quezon, he did a, a, bio, he did a, a biography of our national hero, Jose Rizal, uh, highlighting uh, that one of Rizal's advocacies was indeed the abuses, not of, uh, not the doctrine of the church, but the, but the abuses by local church officials. And even in the 1940s and 50s, you had the local church uh, pushing to, to ban that book, not because it was 
uh, claiming that Catholic doctri religious doctrine was wrong, but because of the critiques of the uh, abuses of the local church officials then. The Grand Lodge of the Philippines, because of its promotion of religious tolerance, was one of those in the forefront to, uh, to fight, who fought against uh, that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of uh, whitewashing of the truth. Most importantly, however, okay, most importantly, the then Filipinos who went abroad, went to, to Spain, okay, to get educated and, to, and who ended up joining Spanish lodges. I think that if we say that Philip Freemasonry is being Filipino in this country, I think most importantly, you can attribute that phrase to them because of the integration of continental Masonic ideals in our site because they brought it here, primarily through the three foundations of our nationhood. What were these three foundations? One, the unified campaign of reforms that they initiated. Remember the equilateral triangle, the large, uh, the newspaper, and the association Hispanico Filipino. Okay, that unified campaign for reforms was initiated by continental Freemasons. That's what led President Aguinaldo, brother Aguinaldo, to say, initiated by Filipinos, led by Filipinos, okay, executed by Filipinos. Okay, and what were they promoting? Here is a major um, misunderstanding on the part of uh, many uh, of those in to this day uh, of why uh, why the church then fought Freemasons. The Freemasons were not talking about their dogma or doctrine. The church was against continental Freemasons then because they promoted liberal ideals of public governance, which these same Filipinos promoted. What were those liberal ideals? The governor for, uh, I'll give you five. The governance of the people through elected representatives. Church then was against that. The separation of church and state. The church then was against that. You, you read the papal bull. I am not joking. This is there. Third, the enforcement of fundamental personal freedoms, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, press as assembly, church was against that. The regulation of basic education by the state and not by religious orders. The church was against that. Many of you in our regular Masonic tradition will recognize this. The principle of the equality and fraternity of mankind under law, the rule of law. That's in our ancient charges. Now, these liberal ideals were brought by these Filipino Masons here, beginning with Marcelo del Pilar. And back then, church to post that, church said, if you promote these ideals, you are excommunicated. We know now that the church does not oppose this. So what is there? to fight about, okay? Most importantly, however, and I wanna end on this, most importantly, we say today that Freemasonry is being Filipino because it was in those continental lodges when the Filipinos joined and eventually they formed their own continental lodges. It was in those continental lodges that they got to discuss the reforms, that they got to realize that, you know, I, Marcelo Del Pilar, am not just someone from the province of Bulacan. I, Jose Rizal, our national hero, am not just someone from the province of Rizal. It was there that they realized that if we are going to push these reforms, we must push this together. And that means we have to construct a new identity for ourselves. That new identity was the genesis of the Filipino nation. That's when they first realized that we are not just Bulacenos or me, my province, Batangueños, Caviteños. We're not from our respective province. We together, we're in this together. We are one nation. 
And it started in those continental lodges. So that's why Freemasonry is being Filipino. That's why it's such a popular catchphrase. And that is why Filipino Freemasons are particularly proud of our heritage force because although today we have we uh, you know we have an organization that is uniform that has a uniform and outlook and joins with you our brethren in regular constitutions okay we are regular freemasons our foundation our soul and our heritage uh, like our national hero here Jose Rizal belongs to continental Freemasonry because that's in a nutshell where Philippine where the Philippines was born. Hope you enjoyed, brethren. If you want additional readings, uh, these are available in London. Uh, we have our centennial uh, book, the uh, history book, 100 Years of Craftsmanship. I edited that. I also We also provided a copy of uh, Philippine Blue Lodges detailing the history, heritage, you know, the uh, seals and uh, illustrations of how Freemasonry is practiced among the uh, over 400 lodges here in my country today. You, you can find that book in the Grand Lodge Library in London. I will try, if there are no copies uh, in Edinburgh, the Grand Lodge Library there, I will, I will send if uh, that is the case. I haven't verified, but I, I'm, we're very willing to send copies there if you want to. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have questions, very happy to answer them. Back to you, Gordon. Brother Terry Callow, can I say thank you so much on behalf of all our guests here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi Lockdown Lecture Series. Your passion for your nation, for your country, and for Freemasonry as being Filipino has certainly shone through this evening. And I'm delighted that you were able to uh, get up early or stay up late to come along and tell us the most interesting story of your nation and its connection with Freemasonry. I uh, thank you so much, Teddy. Uh, let me just open up the questions. I think there's a, a few questions in here. Okay. Did answer the first question about what was it a, a bloodless uh, revolution earlier on. Um, let's see, was it a peaceful revolution? There we go. Uh, from Aubrey Winnie, uh, please pass on fraternal greetings to Lodge Perla del Oriente 1034 from Lodge Britannia 1033 in Chile. Our warrants were issued by the Grand Lodge of Scotland on the same day, uh, 7th of November 1907. So we are twins, uh, twins across the Pacific Ocean as wow. well. Uh, Brother David, there you are, Aubrey. Hiya. Uh, from David Park, Terry. Thank you, Brother Teodoro, for your lecture on Freemasonry in the Philippines. Question Do continental lodges of Freemasons exist today? Well, as you know, there are a lot of continental lodges in Europe, uh, I understand, in France in particular, uh, and in Spain. And there, there was, as I highlighted in my presentation, attempts to form again continental lodges, but these have died out. There are from time to time uh, lodges that spring up, but um, eventually, um, because, because regular Freemasonry is so popular here, uh, eventually everybody ends up going back to uh, the Grand Lodge of the Philippines. We do have some. There's, there's a current schism, but they're, they're compared, compared to us, we're about over 20, 21,000 already. Uh, we're looking at, you're looking at a few hundred Masons, a, a few hundred non-regulars, uh, clandestine Masons. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's not actually uh, a challenge here in the Philippines, though th they do exist. Okay, thank you, Teddy. I and, and, and I want to, Gordon, I, I want to highlight that I have nothing against clandestine. I'm sorry. I have everything against clandestine uh, lodges that misrepresent Freemasonry, but the continental Masonic tradition, even we as regular Freemasons here in uh, the Philippines, we have, uh, we, we have a lot of respect for those lodges, even though we cannot uh, Masonically meet with them. And I'm talking about the lodges 
that continue that tradition in Europe. Yeah, I think everyone understands that. I, as you know, Teddy, we've got Brother Cameron Sloan, I, one of our Scottish brethren, I, with us this evening. Who's here? Who's he's based here, here also? He, he's got up early or stayed up late for us as well. He probably has a wee a drama whiskey in his hands, no doubt. And he says, if Bren want to know a bit more about Lodge Perla de Oriente, uh, 1034, there's an article in the 2020 Grand Lodge of Scotland yearbook, which is that one, Bren. That's the one you can buy from the Grand there Lodge uh, shop. Uh, so we can have a read of and, that. And do visit, do visit them if they're here, if you ever get to our part of the world. <laughs> Uh, John White comments, thank you, Brother Terry, for a most interesting talk, which certainly highlighted the difficulties which our Filipino brand have experienced last experienced through the last few centuries. Uh, excellent. No holds barred. Great history of Philippine Freemasonry. So uh, Ian Walk, who, who's a, a past substitute provincial grandmaster in Fife and Kinross, states, strikes me our Grand Lodge Disciplinary Committee would have had a field day with some of those early brethren. Uh, no doubt, Ian, no doubt. John MacArthur, one of our brethren who visits from Canada in the Grand Lodge of Alberta. Uh, proud to say that Cornerstone number 19, uh, he's a past master of, is 80% Filipinos in Alberta. Uh, we actually, I don't know if it's uh, Alberta. I think it's uh, British Columbia. We have a Filipino who became Grandmaster. Um, and he was actually a member of, uh, with me in uh, Internet Lodge 9659. Uh, I think we are. What's the cost of Freemasonry in the Philippines? Pardon? What's the cost? The cost? How much to it join? It depends on the lodge. It depends on the lodge. We have over 400 lodges. There are lodges where... Uh, the initiation fee is something like uh, $400 US dollars or 500 the equivalent. There are, there is an exceptional lodge where, you know, it depends on, you know, how exclusive they want to be. I, I understand there's one lodge with a fee of up to 2000 US dollars, but you know, so, so lodges pretty much run their own affairs uh, as long as they, you know, are obedient to the, to, to the grand lodge. It, so there's a wide disparity as to as to fees that they charge for initiation, but uniformly, uh, the annual subscription to the Grand Lodge is something like only, uh, I think, uh, thirty dollars equivalent. Okay, so in so, similar... so we have people from all walks of life come mm -hmm. join us. Similar to a uh, Grand Lodge of Scotland then in the ballpark anyway. Joe yeah. Priest asks you, Terry, are there any other orders worked in the Philippines, i.e. Royal Arch, etc.? We do have, but we do have the Royal Arc uh, because we have the York Rite, uh, but we don't practice it. Um, it's it's not as essential as as uh, you know English Freemasonry is. We do have, it's a separate dependent body with, as you know, the American system of York, right? Uh, with the Knights, uh, Templars, and uh, cryptic Masons. We also have the, we, we also have the, uh, the uh, Scottish, right? And there is a host of other orders, uh, some of which you don't recognize. I, I, I don't think the order of Eastern Star is recognized in England. I don't know in Scotland, it's but we have that here. We have... We have it the here Shackle in Knights. Scotland. Okay. So we have the Amaranth, we have the Order of Demolay, uh, we have the Shriners, and actually my uh, I do a webinar series every month. I'll actually I'm my own webinar series. You can look it up in our our web uh, our our on Facebook uh, our cable toe page where the webinar series is broadcast. We'll be focusing on appendant orders uh, next month. I want to highlight that in addition to all of those, we also have a lot of purpose-built clubs. Like we have Birth, which is all the Masons who are in the Bureau of Internal Revenue, our tax. We have a separate club for uh, for um, for soldiers. For we have a separate club for uh, the police. There were attempts actually to even form a uh, club for lawyers. Uh, and the club was supposed to be uh, titled the Harmonious and Exemplary League of Lawyers. But when they got to the acronym HELL, they figured maybe this will uh, not promote. Uh, so so I kind of died there. 
Uh, but I'm sure the lawyers will figure something up. <laughs> Our lawyer brethren will figure are, something up. Are you not a lawyer, Teddy? I am. I am a lawyer, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a comment, Terry, a talk we can learn from in Europe today, no doubt. Uh, well, we learned from Europe. It was because of our European brethren that we are here now. Yeah. Very proud of it. Uh, are there relationships with ladies' Freemasonry and co-masonry in the Philippines? We do not. Good question. There, uh, the, I understand the UGLE does not recognize but acknowledges their existence. We do not have female Freemasons here. So there is nothing to acknowledge. It simply did not sprout here. Okay. If it does, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, a question from Brother Sandy Thompson. What happened to lodges during the Japanese occupation? A lot went dark. Uh, that was a very dark time. Uh, my grandfather, uh, he became Grandmaster in 1974. He went through what we call the death march which was uh, over a hundred miles, a hundred mile march from uh, one province Bataan to two provinces away because there were, there were so many prisoners, you know, they made them all walk. Uh, uh, one third of the Americans uh, in that march died. The Filipinos who were more used to the heat, uh, I think casualties were a little less, but, but uh, it was a terrible period. Lodges were not functioning at that time. Okay, thank you. I, Stuart Wilson I states, thank you for a most informative talk, Teddy. My partner is from the Philippines, uh, Ilocos Norte, and I was there with her in January last Stop year. North. Uh, I would be interested to know if membership is going up or down in recent years and why. It's exploding. We're growing 3 to 5% every year. As a matter of fact, this is ironic. We had, like you, a lockdown this past year, 2020. And we had to, when they started easing, we had to give the discretion. And normally, we would, we would not open. Uh, but we're very traditionalist here. We, we, we cannot do rituals, unlike some American grand lodges which have allowed. We cannot do, uh, we have not allowed lodges to meet online uh, because we're very traditionalist here. But because of the number of applications coming in, uh, we, we gave discretion to Worshipful Masters to meet beginning October uh, because, you know, what we don't want is when we eventually open up, there's a gigantic backlog of all of this. Ironically, you know, more people got online, they got more interested, you know, with our webinars and so forth. It's, uh, I think we, will, we might double our usual rate of 3 to 5% just from the number of applications coming in. Well, that's a fantastic success story, and here's hoping that others can learn from that success. Uh, and it's something that we probably should feed back into the various committees that our Grandmaster Mason has got going. The final question for you uh, this evening, Teddy. Is your York right non-sectarian? Uh, it's actually, I understand the, 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 um, the royal art is, is non-sectarian, but if you go... Definitely the, the Knights Templar, uh, you have to be a Christian Freemason. And I think also the Scottish Rite, uh, you, you, have to be a Christ, you have to be a Trinitarian Christian. So, so in those orders, you do have to be a Trinitarian Christian, but our other orders, you don't have to be. Okay. and the, the, the Brother final... Gordon, I think uh, Brother John Belton is uh, raising his hand. I don't know mm -hmm. if you noticed. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to you in a minute, John. I'll go to this final comment from Cameron, and that will be the final comments in the chat box. Uh, Cameron tells us there's a Scottish chapter and a Scottish Lodging Council, also a Provincial Grand Lodge of the Royal Order of Scotland in the Philippines. So thank you, Cameron, for that. John Belton, your hands up. Yes. Teddy, it's the first time we've met. No, it's not. I've Brother John, we met. That lodge. In, 20, in 2011, we met at, uh, in... Um, oh, yes, we did. You, you don't remember this, but uh, it was the International uh, Conference on the History of Freemasonry yes, in, yes. Uh, in uh, the George Washington Memorial. Yes. But that but was I, like 11 I, years ago. Yes, I missed, <laughs> I missed you when you came to Internet Lodge, but just before that, yeah. this is a happy story, really, for all the brethren. Thank just you. To keep, just to keep your eyes open... 
I was in the house of the temple in Washington, D.C., looking through the Master Mason magazine. That's the done by, edited by Joseph Fort Newton, which I talked to you about. And running down each issue, and suddenly I came to Philippines. Color, goodness me. And uh, I asked the librarian for a copy. And I, I didn't do anything with this sheet of paper. Uh, and then you came over and you came to a meeting of Internet Lodge. And I couldn't be at that meeting, but I gave that bit of paper to Alan Turton, Brother Alan Turton, who who's here. was then the, the, who's here, he was the, the, C, the junior warden of the lodge at the time. And at this point, I think I'll hand the rest of the story over to, to Alan because it's just a, just a lovely bit. Keep your eyes open and you have a happy, different experience. So, so Alan, do you want to unmute and take it? Yes, I, I would love to. It was the most fantastic experience because as junior warden, I gave the toast to the visitors at our festive board. And Teddy will remember very, very well that we, we brought up his lineage as a, a Freemason from his great-grandfather to his grandfather to his grandfather and uh, his journey all the way from Philippines to be with us at Internet Lodge. And he was the farthest travelled visitor on the day. <laughs> I so, enjoyed yeah. that. <coughs> and, and there was the bit of paper you gave him. Yes. Well, uh, John very kindly wrote this all out. And, uh, of course, I did a little bit of uh, my introduction to Teddy, I walked over the floor and uh, gave the piece of paper to Teddy. We're in the middle of a festive board of about 120. <laughs> it was superb, wasn't it, Teddy? Yeah, yeah in Manchester. Yeah, but yeah. This, was, this was an article by his grandfather, published in the Master Mason, somewhere in the 1920s, and he'd never heard about it before. And we could present him with a bit of a paper written by his grandfather, that he'd never heard of on the occasion. And every, every, it was everyone that was, was beautiful. delighted. Yeah, what a surprise. <laughs> Big, That's what you, know, you call Freemasonry Universal. <laughs> uh, it's Absolutely. a small world. So, <laughs> uh, Brian, at that, Brother Teddy Callow uh, from the Grand Lodge of the Philippines, once again, can I thank you so much, sir, for coming along to the Lodge Hope of Karachi and our lockdown lecture series and giving us such a an inspiring story of your nation and what it is to be a Freemason there and its development. Thank you so much. For our next week, we have Brother Charles Winston coming along, who will talk about the painting, the bailey and the lodge. And you're all more than welcome uh, to join us at seven o'clock next week. Teddy, you can go to your bed now, sir. You've worked well this evening. Uh, I know that you've got a holiday weekend coming up and you said that that was part of it. You, you've got time to recover. Uh, but, Brian, please unmute yourself and give your personal thank yous for Teddy for his endeavours this evening. Teddy, Thanks brilliant. Thank you very, very, very much. Good evening. Thank, 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 thank you, brethren. Excellent. Thank you for joining in. Good to have you. Most enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody else. Good night, guys. Teddy, fantastic talk. See you next time, brother. I'm only sorry I didn't actually visit any lodges when I was in the Philippines four years ago. Uh, Glad to have you back. <laughs> I, I intend to get back sometime, uh, Manila and Iloilo. Ilo. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. When this okay. pandemic is over, hopefully. That's <laughs> yeah. fine. <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank, thank, you, thank you, brethren. Thank you for having me. Enjoyed it. Very thank enthusiastic. Love it. You. Thank you very much, Teddy. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. And God thank you very much, brother Teddy. Thank you for coming. I hope to meet us on the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Teddy, and well done, Gordon. Again, well done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Super talk. Thank you, Teddy. And thank you, Cameron Sloan, for joining us from the Philippines as well and keeping on flying the Scottish flag out there. Uh, thank you for staying up, sir. Yeah, thank you, Cameron. No, no, no problems. Well done, Teddy, and uh, we'll talk a bit thank you, brother, uh, later on that. Okay, take care. Okay, Brian, I, for, for the second, uh, first time of the second year, I'm going to give you five. Uh, four. 
Have a have a great Easter, everyone. Thank you again. Happy Easter. Very good Easter. Happy Easter. For Christians here, happy Easter. See. <laughs> Good night, brethren, and thanks very much. Good night, brethren. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, brother Alan. Good night, brother Brian.